at scenes from the Rocky Horror Picture Show, a 1975 musical comedy that has packed movie theater midnight shows for almost a full decade. It may be the ultimate cult movie, meaning it draws repeated viewing from young moviegoers at weird hours. And cult movies now available on video cassette is the subject of this special edition of Siskel and Ebert in the Movies. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. First there were cult movies that people went to the theaters to see, and now there are cult movies that people stay home to see on video cassette. And to get an idea of the cult videos that are the most popular around the country, we did an ambitious but probably fairly unscientific survey of five of the big video chains. And on the special program, we're going to review some of the movies that they claim are reaching cult status. But first, let's take another look at the movie that started it all, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. There were cults before Rocky Horror for movies starring Humphrey Bogart, for example, and W.C. Fields, but nothing like the fanatic loyalty that Rocky Horror fans have exhibited week after week for years in theaters all over the world. A loyalty that is only now beginning finally to trickle out as the original Rocky Horror fans look forward to their children graduating from high school. The kids uh, who go to the Rocky Horror movies come in costumes, they sing and dance along with moments like this one. <laughs> Thousands of words have been used to analyze the secret magic of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, but I've only heard one analysis of the movie that really made any sense to me. I talked to a Rocky Horror fan in Chicago one midnight who said she only really began to enjoy the movie after she knew it by heart so that she didn't have to watch the screen anymore and she could enjoy the party in the theater. Cult movies have got to be able to stand up to lots and lots of viewing oh, yes. and lots and lots of being ignored, too, in a way. Rocky Horror, by the way, is still not available on video cassette, maybe because it still does some business at midnight shows. But at the end of this program, I'm going to fearlessly predict the first movie in years that may have the stuff to challenge Rocky Horror's cult status. I think you're right. The key to these films is that they are communal experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, as we investigate the home video cult movies, mm -hmm. let's see if there is some kind of difference in what you see privately over and over again and whether that is different than the stuff you go to the movie theater for. I bet there might be. Okay. One example of a movie that has achieved cult video status, we're told, is Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange, made in 1971, four years before Rocky Horror. Kubrick's film, and I think it's one of his greatest, is a mind-bending journey into the ultra-violent near future, anticipating a punk revolution where violent kids run wild in the streets, and in this scene, in their own private clubs. Malcolm McDowell plays the music-loving leader of the pack. Freude, schöne Götter, Funken, and it was like, for a moment, oh my brothers, some great bird had flown into the milk bar, and I felt all the malanky little hairs on my plot standing endwise, and the shivers crawling up like slow melancholy lizards, and then down again, because I knew what she sang. It was a bit from the glorious ninth by Ludwig van. <laughs> What happens in this film is McDowell is captured by the police and treated with visual shock therapy, seeing a whole bunch of violent images, sort of like what we go through, Roger, when we see the Friday the 13th series. <laughs> and the result is a pacified, dehumanized Malcolm McDowell. Now, is this what we want as a society? Is this the future we're going to get, whether we want it or not? A Clockwork Orange deals with those individual versus society issues, and it does so with unforgettable images. In fact, and I think this is key, there's some of the same punk images that we see today. You know, I looked at the film again on video only last night, and yep. one of the most amazing things to me was the opening sequence where oh, Malcolm yes. McDowell and his friends are running wild through the city with their clubs, 
beating up on people and things, and I was reminded of the opening shots of Sid and Nancy, the right. punk rock movie that came out this year in which the Sex Pistols, uh, Sid Vicious, is doing exactly right. the same thing. Another thing I felt last night, you know, when this movie came out, I had a lot of reservations about it. I know you did. Based upon the fact that I felt it had all head and no heart. And I still feel that way about the film, that this is a cerebral exercise, not an emotional exercise, but the sad thing is, in the last 15 years, violence in our society has become so pervasive, so much more so even than in 1971, that by now, I was able, in looking at the film, or maybe because I'm older, I was able to share some of Kubrick's own detachment yes. more than the first time I this saw is, it. This is a visionary film. It can be viewed as simply a cool thing, a punk thing, mm -hmm. but I think that the power of this film for adults to rent mm -hmm. is that it is visionary and as current as it was in 1971. And of course, nobody ever questioned Kubrick's filmmaking. He's a great director. When we come back, we'll review one of the strangest and most experimental films to ever gain cult status. It's a beautiful, weird film named Koyana Skatsi. Investigation of cult videos being rented all over the country repeatedly is a film with a strange title called Kayana Skatsi, an American Indian term meaning life out of balance. The film is a breathtaking extended music video in effect, first showing the tranquil beauty of natural America. the film contrasts the natural landscape with the chaos of our man-made environment, accompanied by the music of Philip Glass. That's a powerful film on the small TV screen that you're watching, or a big one if you got one, and I'm sure it's a great film to rent. But I just want to say, I first saw this film in a big theater with great sound in San Francisco, and it was a special treat. So I know you're renting it, I just wish theaters would play it, and you could see it there mm -hmm. too. My only quibble with the film, which I really loved, is that while trying to show life out of balance, director Godfrey Reggio films his city scene so beautifully that even our crazily paced city life, with all the traffic, takes on a peculiar beauty of its own. The film's cult appeal, it's obvious. It's better than any music video I've ever seen. You saw it in San Francisco. I saw it under the stars at the Telluride Film Festival yeah. on a screen stretch between two trees. Yeah. And the thing about seeing this movie over and over, because it is a meditative movie, yes. it doesn't have a plot, right. it has these amazing speeded up images, yeah. is that it encourages you to meditate about our place on this oh, giant yes. planet and uh, our place in the universe and what we're doing with the planet so that it's kind of a meditation aid as well as a music video. And so I guess for meditation, seeing it alone is not so bad, it would be your could point, be, right? Could okay. be, yeah. Our next movie is named Repo Man, and the plot of this movie, which is as different from Kayana Scotsy as you can probably get, the plot of this movie probably holds the record for the longest reach of 1984. It reaches all the way from a team of men who repossess cars to aliens from outer space, and along the way it develops a wacky offbeat sense of humor with a lot of satire on the American consumer society. The film stars Emilio Estevez as a young kid who's looking for a job, and it also stars the legendary character actor Harry Dean Stanton as the veteran repo man who explains the ropes to him. So how much do I get paid? 25 bucks a car? Paid? You don't get paid. Are you kidding? You work on commission, that's better than being paid. Most cars you rip are worth two or three hundred dollars. $50,000 Porsche might make you five grand. It turns out that one of the cars they want to repossess has an alien in the trunk. Oh, Dookie Wookie hurt his wit to hand. You, Archie, just for that you're not in the gang anymore. I'm taking over now. I'll leave it out. King Archie, the Invincible. Shut up, Archie. Hey, Debbie, watch this. <laughs> The special effects don't overwhelm this movie, and so when they do show up, like there, it's a great surprise. 
Repo Man is one of the truly original American films of recent years, and so maybe it's no surprise that it was directed by an outsider, Alex Cox, an Englishman, whose second film was the punk docudrama I just mentioned called Sid and Nancy. This is a movie that slams a lot of different aspects of American culture into each other head on, and then it stands back to watch the sparks fly. And you know what I think one of the cult uh, items in this movie is, and that really, basically, teenagers are renting this film. Yes, I know. They like the old guy. They like Harry Dean Stanton. He is one of these people in the 55 to 60 year old age group who seems to speak the same language as disaffected teenagers. And when he gives in the repo code, which is uh, how to live like a repo man, it's almost like an ersatz uh, code for for teenage life. Okay, and I would have thought that the reason the kids are running this film, which I didn't like as much as you, is because of all the rebellious uh, and humorous stuff in the film. When mm -hmm. they talk about, let's go get sushi and not pay for it, uh -huh. that gets a big, big laugh in the theater. Yeah. So I'm sure it's funny at home. See, I think one of the key things in, the, in this cult stuff at home is it is not being rented by the typical home renter, which is a little bit older. I yeah, think right. that kids who go to the movies a lot are also renting these films a lot, and I think that a key to any cult movie in the theater or at home, is that it be anti-authoritarian against the establishment, and this film certainly well, is that. Well, who could be more anti-authoritarian than the old anti-authoritarian himself, Mr. H.D. Stanton? Coming up next, Stop Making Sense, featuring David Byrne and the anti-authoritarian Talking Heads. Stop making sense. Cult films on video, one of the strangest films in recent years, seems to be running strongly around the country, and its title is Eraserhead. This was the first work by David Lynch, who went on to make Elephant Man, Dune, and the controversial new film Blue Velvet. Eraserhead is weirder than all three of those films put together. It takes place in a world that maybe looks a little like ours. It has things like steam radiators in it anyway. But apparently this is a different universe, a different world, and it stars John Nance, as a frightened man who lives in that world of shadows and evil moments, threats and bizarre visions. To give you an idea of the film's style, here's the scene where he goes to his girlfriend's house for dinner. Do I just, uh, just cut them up like regular chickens? Sure, just cut them up like regular chickens. There's something really unsettling about the way that tiny little chicken is still alive on the plate, but that's nothing compared to the central scenes in this movie, where the hero and his girlfriend give birth to some kind of lizard monster that cries for the rest of the film until the gruesome ending, after which it doesn't cry anymore. The best thing about Eraserhead is the way it creates an absolutely original, threatening universe. Nothing in this movie seems reassuring or familiar. But one note, by the way, because I watched it just in the last couple of days on video. The movie is shot in a lot of darkness and shadows, mm -hmm. and it's hard to see some of the details if you watch it on video, details that would be clear in a movie theater. Now, I didn't like the film when it came out. I still don't like it. Um, I'm trying to figure out what is the appeal of it. First of all, it's very confusing to follow, but I'm trying to think that uh, it is more of the college-age crowd that is embracing this mm -hmm. film, and maybe they feel so alienated by the world around them that all the threats that are involved in this guy are all the kind of subconscious and sometimes conscious threats mm -hmm. that they feel themselves. This, I mean, well, they, they, they don't identify with this guy as much as they I'll identify you, with what is coming at him. I'll tell you what it reminds me of. Uh, this film reminds me of a film made 55 years ago called Lodge Door by right. Salvador Dali and Louis Bunuel, one of the great masterpieces mm -hmm. of surrealism. Both films have very disgusting images shot in a very crude way, in a very surrealistic way. Uh, and in the 60s, I think it might have been called a bad trip. Sometimes people want to go on one. It just makes them feel kind of creepy, and that's maybe what they're looking for. Okay. Our next cult video is also a long-playing concert film. It's celebrating its second year of weekend shows in many theaters around the country. Now it's on videotape. The film is Stop Making Sense, and it features the music of David Byrne and the Talking Heads. But credit for the success of this movie and its cult video status must be shared, I think, by the musicians with the film's director, Jonathan Demme who has the good sense to place his camera right up on stage with David Byrne and his crew and simply let them perform with all the joy they possess, as in this great musical number.
burning down the house, one of the best numbers in the film. What's so appealing here, as opposed to other rock concert films, is that David Byrne and the Talking Heads seem to respect their audience and their music. They don't come across as a typically angry and aloof set of musicians. Again, this is a better music video than anything you can find on MTV, so why not rent it? I love the way they love their music. You know, one of the things I love about this film is the incredible, boundless physical energy of David yes. Byrne. He runs around the stage. It must be five miles during this film. Mm -hmm. This is like uh, the Olympiad meets rock music. And the physical energy combined with the musical energy makes this whole film so upbeat and so vivifying that that's one of the reasons I really enjoyed well, this, it. I, you pick on the word upbeat. I, mean, I see a lot of rock concert film footage and it looks like the audience is being oppressed. Like yeah. me or I'll throw my guitar in your face. Mm -hmm. These guys are celebrating their music and I respect yeah, them. A lot of it. rock concerts are like Nazi rallies. This yeah. one is more like uh, up with music. When we come back, my <laughs> nomination for a movie that may become as big a cult favorite as Rocky Horror. This one is called The Little Shop of Horrors. You'll be a dentist. You have a talent for causing things. A little horror film called Reanimator, and horror elements do have a way of popping up in occult films and videos. The Night Owl crowd does want to be shocked, and horror films, by their very nature, stray from the straight and narrow. Reanimator comes from an H.P. Lovecraft story and offers us a decapitated genius walking around with head in hand, looking for plasma to keep his brain alive. <laughs> kind of scene can be a gross out, but it's handled here with good humor, and it's also the kind of scene that kids pass along saying to their friends, you've got to see this picture, and then they hand them the tape across the street, and it's all over the neighborhood. Well, I've condemned a lot of violent pictures over the years, but not ones with good humor about themselves, which is what director Stuart Gordon displays here in this zombie tale. Gordon also recently directed the even more enjoyable From Beyond, a cult hit, I'm sure, in the future, and he's turning out to be a cult director with a name that stands for good, old, funny, and gory times at the movies. You know, a lot of people who aren't familiar with what movies have come to in 1986 will probably be a little appalled when you describe Reanimator as a good old time at the movies, but I know what you mean. It has a good heart, and it's, uh, it, is, it is funny and satirical. Yeah, I liked it a lot. Mm -hmm. Our next movie is not on video yet. In fact, it's still playing in a lot of theaters, but it's my prediction that The Little Shop of Horrors is the first movie since the Rocky Horror Picture Show that has the potential to break through and become a really enormous cult hit at the box office and then later on video at home. The movie stars Rick Moranis and Ellen Green in a romantic musical that takes place in a flower shop where one of the plants is a man-eater. Feed me see more. Feed me all night long. <laughs> That's right, boy. You can do it. Feed me see more. Feed me all night long. <laughs> Cause if you feed me see my I can grow up big and strong. The supporting cast looks like a roll call of popular comedians. Here's John Candy. Hi everybody, it's weird. Wait, Wilkinson laughing and scratching. That's how's everybody doing today? I got a little bit of a stiff neck. Let me just fix this up. Ooh, that feels a lot better. Well, I got a great show for you today with some wonderful weird stuff. Little Shop of Horrors has everything it takes to be a midnight cult film. Weird costumes, good songs, dumb dance scenes, and lots of sex and violence. I think our standards have totally degenerated now at the end of this show. Our brains have been fried by cult movies just like everybody else. As we said earlier, that Rocky Horror is still not available on video because it's still doing business at the box office. My prediction is that Little Shop of Horrors will replace Rocky Horror at the midnight theatrical box office. Rocky Horror will then come out on video and it will inspire the most bizarre pajama parties in history. We're both in our low 40s, mm -hmm. and yet I feel as you I, like we're 14 or 15 years yeah. old because that's what this stuff is. I mean, this is elemental movie going, which is 
no holds barred, mm -hmm. fun entertainment, off the wall, a place you've never been before, avant-garde, dangerous, your mm -hmm. parents wouldn't want you to see it, all, all of that stuff wrapped up, and that's what these and movies are. And then when are. you bring it home on video, what happens is, I think, may, mainly with these cult films, we were talking about how, what is it like to see the movie by yourself? But yeah. In many cases, they're not seeing it by themselves. This is, this I mentioned party pajama films. parties. Yeah. This is the next generation I think so too. of pajama parties where the kids bringing the films home and reciting the lines right along with the old TV set. That's it for the special survey of the new generation of video cult movies. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of four new films. And until then, the balcony is closed. Thank you.